Our moderator today is uh, Zachary Hood. He's a scientist at the U.S. Department of Energy's Argonne National Laboratory, and he's working on materials for energy storage and conversion. His current research focuses on the development of solid-state ion conductors for lithium and sodium metal batteries. And with that, Dr. Hood, I'm going to turn this webinar over to you. Great. Thanks, Paula, for the excellent introduction. I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Zachary Hood, and I'm an Argonne Scholar at Argonne National Lab. And I'm a member of the MRS Early Career Professional Subcommittee who organized this webinar series. The webinar series is titled How to Land a Faculty Physician from Application to Interview. In today's part of the webinar series, we're specifically going to address the application process to primarily undergraduate institutions. We have some exciting uh, panelists as well as a uh, main speaker um, who I will be introducing in one of the following slides. So the goals of today's webinar are as follows. So um, first, we're going to address the faculty application, application process and what makes for an outstanding package for academic positions at primarily undergraduate institutions. Uh, next, we're going to also highlight the documents within the application package up to the interview as well as the offer. Also, we're going to have a panel discussion with established academics that will highlight what they specifically look uh, for in the applicants at each step of this process. Then lastly, we're going to have an audience Q&A session with the main speaker as well as our panelists. As Bob mentioned, we want you to uh, put your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your uh, Zoom platform. Rather, don't put it into the chat function, but into that Q&A tab such that we can uh, best address these questions. So without further ado, I want to introduce our main speaker as well as our panelists. Um, I'm going to ask them each uh, two questions in order to uh, make the, uh, the best introduction possible. So number one, I'm going to ask uh, each of them, why did you choose a career at a primarily undergraduate institution? And number two, I'm going to ask you the, the topic of your current research such that our audience can get an idea of um, what sort of research background you have. So our main speaker today is Jeffrey Christians, who's an assistant professor of engineering at Hope College. So Jeff, why did you choose a career at a PUI, and what is the topic of your current research? Hi, thanks, Zach. Um, so first of all, thank you to all the people that are here. Um, we're really excited, and hopefully you guys all find this uh, discussion useful and as you think about um, PUIs. So I'm at a, a PUI, um, I've been at Hope for two years, and I'll talk a little bit more about this um, in a bit, but I really wanted a, a career that, um, that really kind of meshed uh, teaching and research. Um, and I think the, the PUI that I'm at, I, I get the balance of that that I am interested in. Um, I'm still in, in the lab a lot, I'm at working with undergrads, so it forces me to be in the lab and not just be a professional grant writer, although I do my fair share of that as well. Um, so I, I liked it because it, it gives me a chance to teach, which is something I really like. Um, gives me a chance to be in the lab more than I maybe would be um, were I at uh, a different type of, of institution. Um, and my current research uh, right now, uh, my research is, is working on materials for energy. Um, and a lot of the work that we're doing right now in our group is uh, looking at halide perovskites. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction. I agree, you know, being able to do work in the lab, you know, is very uh, great, you know, it's very gratifying, you know, whenever you get to do that at a primarily undergraduate institution. Thank you. Um, so our next, uh, our well, first panelist is going to be Melanie Berkman. Uh, she's an associate professor of chemistry and biochemistry at Suffolk University. So Melanie, can you tell us why you chose a career at a PUI? And then also, what is the topic of your current research? Uh, yeah, um, I chose to become a professor at a PUI because, um, like Jeff said, I really wanted to be able to do both teaching and research. If you go and teach at a community college, you have very few opportunities to do research. And if you go to an R1 institution, you might teach only a few hours a week. And I really wanted to have the balance of both. Um, in particular, I really love the satisfaction that you get when you put in a certain amount of time to improve your teaching or your class, and then you always get a better outcome. Whereas with research, I can find it very frustrating where you could work on something for six months and maybe not have anything tangible to show for it. So the two things keep me balanced. Um, my research, I actually have two um, research projects. My major research project is on bacterial mating, and I use a 
variety of molecular biochemical techniques to understand how DNA is transferred from one bacterium to another. And this is really important in terms of trying to prevent the spread of antibiotic resistance genes. My other research project I developed for a teaching lab that I do where it, we explore clinically relevant mutations in, um, in metabolic disease enzymes. Thank you so much for that introduction. Yeah, and I agree, you know, it sounds like, you know, you find the good work-life balance, you know, within, um, you know, your, your PUI. Um, so then uh, our second panelist is Andrea Monroe. She's a associate professor of chemistry at Pacific Lutheran University. So Andrea, can you tell us why you chose a career at a PUI? And then also what is the topic of your current research? Um, sure. Hold on, I wrote something so I don't go over. Um, so I, I loved and I still love working with undergraduate students. That's what really um, pushed me to work at a primarily undergraduate institution. Uh, most of my experiences in grad school um, involved mentoring undergraduate researchers, um, and I found that to be really fulfilling. Um, I also like doing outreach, and I liked when I got to TA, um, I liked working with chem majors, but also the non-majors. And I have more opportunities um, in an undergraduate institution um, to work with a broader base of students. Um, so I, I specifically had wanted to mentor undergraduates um, because that's when they're considering career options. Um, they sign up to work with me for a summer and they may not continue after 10 weeks in my lab. And I like um, giving them the opportunity to try out research and to see if it's really their passion. It's exciting when it is and they go to graduate school. But I also like to give people the opportunity to decide that something else is what really um, gets them wrapped up. Um, so my, my um, focus has always been in that I liked working with students in this developmental stage. Um, and I wanted to focus on teaching undergraduates in the class and in the lab um, instead of focusing on graduate students. And so that was an appeal for me. Great, thank you so much for that, uh, that introduction. And you know that it's an excellent appeal for, for a career at a PUI. Um, so now that we address the, the why. Oh, I forgot, sorry, oh, sorry, I forgot to tell you my research focus. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> we're good. Um, we work on the synthesis and characterization of colloidal nanocrystal quantum dots. Um, we make doped crystals, core shell crystals. We make them in different shapes um, and often try to examine um, why we produce what we do with a given synthesis. Uh, we also do ligand exchange studies um, and look at stability. And so all of our work um, is in the goal of producing better nanocrystals for applications, but we really focus on the nanocrystals themselves. It's fascinating, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, you know, now that we address you know, the why um, and also a little bit about your background, um, we're going to move on to our, um, our main recorded talk from Jeff, uh, Jeffrey Christians, um, who will explain the process of how to apply to a PUI and some of the, the ways that you can best prepare. So I'll um, stop sharing my screen now and I'll turn it over to the pre-recorded presentation. So I want to spend the next 20 or 25 minutes, we'll see how long this takes me, uh, trying to set the stage for what we're going to talk about in the rest of this uh, panel discussion. Uh, hopefully I can uh, have a little bit of uh, background information and overall information about applying to a PUI that you'll find useful and if nothing else spur questions and topics for, for discussion later. Before I want to dive into really this uh, content, I want to give you a little bit of a picture of who I am and where I'm coming from. I have my bachelor's degree from a PUI. Um, then I did my post, I did my PhD at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, toward the end of that time, I had a specific mentored teaching, uh, kind of a, an apprenticeship really, um, for the intro engineering course at Notre Dame. And I was also able to be involved in some specific teaching workshops and trainings through um, their kind of teaching center. Um, so I had a, a fair amount of teaching experience, at least for kind of the typical graduate student. Um, when I was coming out of graduate school, and then I did a postdoc at NREL at a national lab, which was entirely a research postdoc. Um, before you 
actually apply or before you really think about applying, you should ask yourself, would I want to work at a PUI? Um, so at a PUI, there's going to be significantly more teaching than, say, at a, a research institution. I'll make that comparison or that contrast um, quite often. But um, you have to ask yourself, right, do you like teaching? Do you like mentoring? So why I'm at a PUI, I really had a great research experience when I was an undergraduate. Um, you know, that really shaped my interest in science and my, my interest in going on to graduate school and the ability to now be on the other side of that relationship uh, is really meaningful and something that I really enjoy. Um, and being in the classroom. Uh, I, I love teaching. I think it's it's been really fun to try to, um, you know, kind of figure out different ways to to help teach people and watch the growth of students from, you know, early on in their their engineering career to um, by the, to the time that they graduate. That's something that I really enjoy, and, and the kind of working with lots of different students um, has been a fantastic part of my job. Uh, there are downsides to life at a PUI. Um, some people think that there's better work-life balance. Um, I have a question there. Just is there? I don't know. I don't have a good answer for that. I think maybe there is, maybe there's not, depending on who you are and what your own expectations are and, and kind of what you end up getting involved in and your own specific situation. So I'm not sure, right, if you're going to a PUI to find better work-life balance, maybe you'll find it, maybe you won't. I think, right, that's a challenging thing that I think we're all looking for and um, you know, it, it's it's just challenging to find. Um, some other downsides, COVID has been really hard on PUIs generally. Um, you know, there are a number of uh, schools, Hope has, been, has not been laying off any people, but um, I know a number of different schools that have been. Um, I think uh, a trend which I would assume would be um, maybe kind of COVID uh, drawn out or accelerated is the trend of hiring visiting professors or adjuncts instead of tenure track professors. Um, and then of course, low pay, low pay relative to industry, relative to more research intensive institutions, um, and kind of a general trend of rising research expectations, uh, often with less support. So, uh, right, I think kind of talking to, to people at different PUIs, I think some feel like you know, there are rising expectations for research, but there's no extra support. Um, so that's uh, a, a, few, a few different things, and I, I'll let my colleagues um, talk about some of their experiences with some of those uh, later on, and maybe we can, we can hit some of those in the Q&A if you have any questions on um, what life is like at a PUI specifically. Uh, but let's assume that you want to come to work at a PUI. I think that's a lot, it's a great place to work, or they can be great places to work. Um, I think you have to ask yourself, what can you do if you're an earlier career graduate student or postdoc, uh, what can you do to boost your resume and really rise to the top of the pile? You know, I think we know what needs to happen at an R1, um, right? You need the science paper, you need the nature paper. Uh, at, a, at a PUI, those things are all great but that's not going to make your resume rise to the top of the pile necessarily. Um, right? If you, if you have those, great, but really you need, um, you need the research experience. You also need to show an interest in teaching and, and hopefully have some sort of teaching experience. And that doesn't necessarily mean you have to have taught a class, although if you can find experiences like that, that's great. Um, but you really want to show through your experience that you are um, you've really been see seeking out ways to be um, specifically involved in teaching and mentoring, um, and you really want to try to find those ways to, uh, right, it, once you get the job, it will be really beneficial to have some of this experience, and it, it gives you things to, to talk about in your application and to talk about on the interview and, and to build some of those skills and help you know if you actually want to continue doing this um, as a career. Sorry, this first point, um, do your homework. 
Uh, in some ways, this is the most challenging part for a PUI. So I'll tell you a little bit about Hope College um, to try to set the stage for this part. So Hope is a private liberal arts school. We're medium in size. Um, we're doing okay financially, but you know, if anybody has an extra billion dollars, we definitely would take that. Um, we're a well-regarded school, but not elite. Um, so you can see kind of where we rank from, from US News. Um, good, not great. Um, but we do have a strong undergraduate research tradition. So we have a high percentage of students going on to getting PhDs. And um, for chemical engineering graduates, which is my field, uh, it's something like maybe 20% of our graduates are going on to getting PhDs. Um, in chemistry, again, which I'm, I'm somewhat affiliated with, um, it's maybe more like 25%. And it's really across the natural sciences. So in our natural sciences division, we have about 60 faculty who are research active um, and typically about 140 or 150 uh, undergraduates. So all of the faculty in the division, um, nearly all of the faculty are research active and we tend to have a lot of students involved in that as well. I was hired at HOPE in 2018. So I have just two years experience. Um, teaching there. I'm one of 11 professors in engineering, so all engineering, one of only two chemies. Um, my nominal uh, load, is an, a full-time load is 12 credits. Um, I have a one course release for research, so I'm nominally 75% teaching, 25% research. Um, and because there are only two chemies um, and only 11 engineering profs total, I teach courses both uh, chemi specific and more general. So I teach across the engineering curriculum despite the fact that uh, right I'm a chemi. I, I teach civil engineers in some of my classes, um, uh, mechanical engineers, uh, even have some electrical engineers in uh, say some classes. So it's definitely uh, an interdisciplinary um, side from from the teaching side. Um, my teaching responsibilities, as I said, nine credits per semester. That's typically in our department. We try to keep that to just two preps. So that would be two different courses. So you're teaching the same course, two sections. Um, there's tends to be uh, graders for most courses, although not some upper level courses because we haven't had anybody that's still at Hope that um, has actually taken the class before for some senior level courses. Um, so then those were courses that the instructors or um, professors would be grading all the homework and assignments for. Um, and there tends to be, because we have a fairly small department um, and because we're situated in a liberal arts school, there's not a lot of bandwidth for, um, say, somebody like me coming in and, and designing an elective course because students don't have freedom in their schedule to be able to take it. Um, our faculty are already teaching um, overload in order to be able to, to teach the courses that we're offering, so there's just not a lot of bandwidth for that. During the academic year, nominally 25% of my time is research. Um, I try to manage my schedule so that stays um, approximately that, 25%, um, maybe even a little bit more. Um, I try to have student researchers in the lab when I can, although balancing everybody's schedule is is challenging. And I find, um, right, and this is something I, I knew going in, but really uh, balancing in, say, nominally 25% of your time, balancing lab work, writing grants, keeping up with the literature, writing papers, um, right, that's a, that's a difficult balance during the semester. And that's kind of the, the common theme that um, I hear from, from colleagues and from people at other PUIs that that's um, one of the things that they find really challenging during the academic year. Um, one of the other responsibilities that um, we have is service to both the department and the college. Um, and that's something where because we're a smaller school, I, th I really like this aspect of, uh, of the service because I think it, it allows me to uh, find places in the college and have a bigger voice than I would at a larger school. 
So you can feel like, you know, you're really making a difference in that school and in that area that you care about and you can kind of seek out some of these opportunities. So that's something that obviously I'm, I'm relatively new at Hope, but I'm starting to find some places where uh, you can kind of plug into the, the life of the college and the life of the institution, which um, can be good. Um, and has, right, there's always uh, service opportunities and committees and all kinds of stuff that um, are less thrilling and exciting. But I think a smaller school, it, it allows you to, to hopefully um, try to find places that, that that can be a meaningful part of the job as well. During the summer, uh, I don't have any teaching responsibilities, although um, you can. You can teach summer courses for additional pay. Um, our research groups at HOPE typically range from zero students to as many as 10. Mine has been four or five, and that's um, fairly common for new faculty. New faculty um, are expected to have a research group, um, so zero probably is, is not going to be a, a fast track to tenure, um, but there are some tenured profs that don't have any, although at HOPE it's, it's quite few. Um, and then even uh, right during the summer research, um, you know, with four or five undergraduate students, hopefully you have some that are returning. Um, you're going to be balancing, you know, you have a short 10 week program, or at least that's what our, our research program typically is. So then you're trying to balance um, as much lab work as you can in that 10 weeks with all of your other um, research responsibilities. So that's Right, I have the same difficult balance. I think that's um, usually when people are unhappy with their job at PUIs, so this has kind of been my, um, my feel for things, talking to different people. Usually it, when they're unhappy, it's because they have more research responsibilities or they want to do more research and they find that they just can't. Um, there are too many things to juggle. Uh, and that can be one of the things that, that's challenging at a PUI. Um, really a key point that hopefully you get a, from some of the discussion uh, here, but then also maybe some of the discussion later during the Q&A is that uh, you really have to do your homework if you're looking at PUIs because all of them are, are different. Um, there, there's a lot of variety, way more than, uh, or at least my perspective is, is that it, it, there's a lot more variety than there is at, say, R1s, um, or even R1 to R2 um, type institutions, um, right? Liberal arts versus a technical school, bachelors only, like Hope College versus schools that have master's program, um, research intensive, teaching focused. Um, and some of this can even vary by department. So the school that I went to undergraduate um, at uh, Kelvin University, um, I was in the engineering department, but I did research in the chemistry department because the engineering department wasn't really a research active um, department. Most of the profs there, um, some were involved in research, many were involved in consulting and in other types of things. Um, which weren't undergraduate research. So I, I think um, you really have to, to try to get a feel for what the school is like. What's the department size, right? That will help tell you um, maybe what kind of teaching responsibilities you're gonna have. Is there a religious affiliation? Um, if yes, what does that look like? And how does that fit? Do you feel like you know this is a school where you could really fit into the mission of the college? Um, and what is the starting salary? This is something, again, that's going to vary a lot based on the institution. You can find some basic data um, here at data.chronicle.com, but of course that's always going to be less than industry um, and less than R1 institutions and less than um, maybe other non-academic or non-research type uh, positions that, that you might be looking at. So, you know, I think it's really important to, to know that. Um, but also to know, you know, if this is something that you're interested in, be interested in it for the right reasons. You're not going to be coming in uh, um, as, as for the for the lucrative salary. Research is probably the 
aspect of P. Well, maybe. Uh, but it, uh, in my perspective, I, I think it's probably the aspect of PUIs that varies the most um, institution to institution and even department to department. Uh, so you really want to dig in before you even apply or before you start your application, you really have to dig in on what does research look like? Um, right? How many papers do people typically publish? How big are research groups? Um, are there faculty startup funds? A key question, I think, is what is the level of institutional support? Um, right? Do they do they know what they're doing as far as research? Um, do they know what it takes to run a research program? Have they been there before? Um, you really want to start to comb as much as you can um, department web pages, university web pages, Google, um, professor CVs. You want to start to comb some of these documents for as much data as you can to get a feel for what research looks like at that school and then make sure that that fits with what your expectations would be in a place that you would like to work. When you get this picture then you can actually move in and start to craft a research statement. Um, know that you're going to be writing this research statement to a broader, a much more general audience than you would in an R1. Uh, right, my research statement that I wrote to Hope College was read by a single other chemical engineer who was totally not in my field. And then a bunch of other engineers who were also completely not in my field. So that was the audience that I was writing to. Um, so you're going to um, have to tailor it specifically to that audience. So look through the department. Who are these people? What are their, um, what is their expertise? You want to limit the scope versus an R1 statement. If you send Hope College the research statement that you sent the University of Notre Dame, um, if Notre Dame looks at it because um, it's a great research statement, that's great. Um, Hope College won't look at it because we don't think that you'll be able to be successful um, at Hope, right? And that's really what we're looking at is we want we want people who are going to be successful at our institution. Um, so we want to make sure that you are um, planning an ambitious proposal, right? We don't want second quality research. We want really good research, um, but we want it to be reasonable. So I have here the, the goal for your research statement maybe to keep in mind is to keep it ambitious, but keep it reasonable. Um, and then as much as you can, if you've found things uh, specifically about the department, um, right? You want to show that you thought of details, um, that you thought of mentoring students, student outcomes, where you could get funding, um, what kind of facilities you would need, uh, what instruments you would need, what instruments already exist at the facility that you could use, um, that you've kind of shown how your research or your research plan can fit in that institution. And that's really what uh, one of the main things that they're going to be looking for. When you're looking at crafting a teaching statement, uh, just understand, right, that teaching is probably the main focus of that college. So they want to know that you know that, um, right? This is going to be your primary role. So you want to explain what led you to apply. Um, and then as much as you can highlight um, Right, that you know, uh, that you want to teach, that you know about teaching, that you have experience. Right, this is where you're going to really be um, showing that you thought about teaching, that you thought about teaching style and your philosophy, um, and then also uh, just what courses might you teach. I have here caution: you may actually teach these. So that, right, this is you want to say that you can teach a lot of different courses. You want to be flexible, but but know that you actually. Um, are going to be teaching some of these courses. Um, but also know, right, you don't have to be a, a world expert uh, in order to teach an undergraduate course, um, or really any course. But, uh, right, if, you go, if you're going to a smaller school or a smaller department, right, people are going to want to take sabbaticals and maternity leaves and different things like that. So you're going to have to be teaching across a curriculum um, so you want to be uh, flexible in this, but but also not uh, say that you could teach anything in, 
in the whole department because uh, they may hold you to your word. Okay, so let's say you, you write a great cover letter, research statement, teaching statement, um, and you get an interview. What does that look like? Um, the first round of interviews um, typically are short. They'll almost assuredly be virtual. All of when I had interviews, all of them, uh, whether it was a PY or um, anywhere else, um, the first round of interviews were virtual. Um, and then at least pre-COVID, we used to have things like on-site interviews. I don't know what it's going to look like now. Maybe this will be a thing again. Um, those are typically one to two days. You meet with a lot of people, students, faculty, um, probably the dean. Um, when I had my interview at Hope, I met with the provost and the president. So you might meet with um, you know, all kinds of different people at the college. So you're gonna get different questions from uh, all of these different people. Uh, you might get asked by the provost, um, you know, what, uh, what it is that, that makes you want to have a job at a PUI or what it is specifically that you can bring to the college. Um, you might get asked by the president, you know, how, how do you align with the mission of the college and how do you see yourself fitting into that? Um, and then you might get asked by faculty members, what courses could you teach? What is your research going to look like? What space do you need? Um, so you want to have a lot of these uh, these things already ready otherwise it's going to be a very stressful um, a stressful day or two in addition to those answers though and have thought about some of the questions that you may be asked um, have a lot of questions ready right you you might come in um, and i had this experience i come in and, and you're meeting with somebody for for 30 minutes and you sit down and the first thing that they sell you, they look across the table um, and say, okay, do you have any questions for me? And you have 30 minutes on the clock and you're sitting there and you better come up with some questions or it's gonna be a pretty awkward 30 minutes. Um, so this true story has happened to me in, in an academic interview. Um, so you really wanna think out a, a list of questions that uh, you don't necessarily have to have it written down but a list of questions that if you find yourself in situations, because one thing you want to know the answers to the questions, um, but also, right, it's, it's a long and exhausting interview and maybe, you know, halfway through, you don't really care what the answers are anymore. You just want to get through this um, and make a good impression. So you want to have some of these questions ready in order to, in order to do that. Uh, Part of the interview, a key part of the interview is the talk. Um, just, I think, you know, by the time you get to your interview talk, you've given a lot of different talks. Um, but the key advice that I'll give is know their expectations. Um, know what it is they expect for your talk. Um, who's going to be there? How long it's going to be? What kind of topics they want you to cover? Do they want you to cover? Um, your research or do they want you to cover your research proposal or do they want you to you know do a kind of a mix of the two um, what are the people what is the audience going to be like um, and then also sometimes there'll be things beyond the research talk maybe um, a mock class maybe there will be a specific section of the the interview that'll be more like a research proposal talk or a chalk talk um, I'm not sure how common that is at, at PUIs. I haven't had that experience in a, an interview for a PUI, um, but I have at other institutions. So that's something that um, you really want to try to tease out what, um, what these different talks are and what the expectations are uh, for each of them so that you know what you're getting into and that you're well prepared, that there are no surprises on the day of the interview, that everybody's on the same page. So hopefully that gives a little bit of a flavor to um, kind of at least some overarching thoughts. Uh, I'll just leave with a couple points before we kind of jump into the second half of this session. Um, I think one of the, the key things that I, I want you to take away, hopefully, is that um, really look into uh, maybe even more than when you're applying to an R1 
you have to look into why specifically do you want to work at this PUI. Um, what is it about this one? You want to really try to learn about the specific school and department because um, PUIs can be really different. Um, and you don't want to put the time and effort into applying if it's not a place that you want to work. Um, when you're writing your research plan, it can be a little bit more challenging uh, in some ways because uh, research expectations can change a lot institution to institution. So you want to make sure you tailor your research plan to the institution and you make it ambitious but reasonable. You're right, you want it to be a, a research plan that can actually be accomplished at the school that you're applying at. And then once you get to the interview, um, right? remember interviews are exhausting. Make sure that you're well prepared, have both questions and answers ready. And then the same thing with your talks. Make sure you know what they expect so that you, um, you know, that there are no surprises, that you know what who the audience is and you know what's expected of you as um, you come to give your talk. So I'll leave it at that for at least for this portion of the presentation and I'll let um, some of my colleagues uh, fill in some of the, the points that I missed here and then uh, we'll kick off to the to the Q&A. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Jeff, for the excellent presentation. I want to give you a virtual high five for preparing that and also having it uh, recorded uh, prior to this, this webinar. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, at this point, we wanted to give the panelists a chance to, um, to elucidate a little bit further about their experience with the application process um, of applying to a PUI. So Andrea actually um, uh, volunteered to go first uh, for this part. So Andrea, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so Jeff's presentation really hit on some important points um, for anyone who's thinking about a PUI or putting an application together. And I really want to re-emphasize, um, before I dive into my, mind, my main point, um, about what he said about the importance of your teaching statement. Um, teaching is probably the most important job a professor has at a PUI, and it's certainly the thing we spend the most amount of time doing. So if you don't like teaching, you should not <laughs> apply to a PUI. So, but once you get your teaching statement in order, um, keep bearing in mind that PUIs usually have teaching as part of our brand. Right? We advertise that you have classes with faculty, you're in lab with faculty. Um, so once you can demonstrate your thoughtfulness about your teaching and your experience, um, then we're going to be looking at your research statements. So <laughs> I want to talk um, in this little time about um, my advice for how to design um, and pitch your research program um, for a PUI so that it is, as Jeff said, ambitious but reasonable. So I'm going to talk about what that means. Um, so you need to propose a research project, right? Not just one, but a <laughs> something you're going to do into the future that's of interest to the scientific community because it should be publishable and novel enough to get funding. Um, you won't always be required to get funding, but everyone needs to believe it's fundable. Um, the hiring committee wants to be confident that if they hire you, you will get tenure when you come up for it. You're being invested in by the university, so that needs to be your mindset. Um, while your research needs to be novel, because it needs to be publishable and fundable, it must also be doable with the instrumentation available to you. Also, with limited time for research, and it should be doable with undergraduate researchers. This means that you need to kind of find a niche that is interesting to faculty at an R1, um, but that you won't be scooped, or that if someone is working in the area, you can still contribute to the field in a meaningful way. Um, so this takes some creativity. Um, so in order to prepare to apply to a PUI, I made sure that during my postdoc, I spent some time learning to do electrochemistry, things like cyclic voltammetry, um, DPV, so that I could broaden my experience with instrumentation um, and techniques that have kind of a lower cost for the instruments and a lower maintenance. Um, that was really important because sometimes we need to work with less expensive instrumentation. Um, at a PUI, um, you may also not have the support you're used to if you're currently at an R1. Um, we don't have a lot of instrument techs. Uh, you might have one. Um, so in my lab, 
I regenerate the glove box, right? <laughs> I am tenured and I regenerate the glove box. I turn it on and off. Um, one of my colleagues, when the, when the NMR needs to be serviced, he's on the phone with Bruker, right? That's part of the, that's part of our job. Some places do have instrument techs. So that was part of the differences in PUIs alluded to. Um, we also have a lot of older instrumentations that we keep going. Um, for classes and research. Um, and so if you have experience servicing or maintaining instruments, maybe as a lab job, um, and if you're not scared to open up an instrument and do some repairs, if you're good with duct tape, if you help your advisor set up their lab, these are things to highlight um, in your application materials or to have your letter writers highlight for you. Uh, they are things that we think about, they're practical matters about being able to do your research in our context. The other pieces of advice I have are that when you're writing your research statement, you need to be thinking about how you will recruit and mentor undergraduate students in your lab and what they will do. That's gonna be a question because you're being hired to do research with undergrads. That's what you are bringing to the department um, often. You also wanna do research on the resources near your PUI or that you can access. So for example, I'm in Tacoma, Washington, and I take samples up to the University of Washington in Seattle to do XRD, TEM, SEM, me knowing about the user facility and the rates helps me convince my department that I could do my research at their institution without those tools there. Um, and so that's important. If you do environmental work, thinking about where you might sample locally is something to include to show you've been thoughtful. Also consider how your research project fits in with the research being done at that institution. Do you fill a gap? Um, or are there people you can collaborate with? So think about you as a member of this department. Um, not just as your singular self. Um, and most important, collaborate, 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 and network. Um, I have been most productive when I work with others. Um, it's, it can be very isolating being one of the few physical chemists in my department and the only colloidal nanocrystal person. So when I'm able to collaborate with someone I knew from graduate school or someone I've met at a conference, when my science has more impact, we can actually do more things. Um, but it also helps me prioritize research because my students always want feedback and all the service I get pestered about. And so research is easy to fall off your radar if you're not accountable to someone else. Um, so the main thing though is that doing research at a PUI takes a fair amount of creativity and resourcefulness. Um, you wanna do interesting science with limited time and resources. Um, and so readers of your application want to know that you're aware of these challenges, but that you see them as opportunities and that you really want to do research in this context. Um, so those are my bits of advice and we can answer more questions about that in a bit. Great, thank you so much, Andrea, for the excellent words of advice. This is super informative and it is a really great, um, you know, echo of um, some of the points Jeff brought up and a good elucidation of some, you know, extra points to consider. So thank you so much. Um, I'd like to give the floor to our second panelist, uh, Melanie Berkman. Uh, so take it away. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I want to echo that echo um, that Jeff's talk was really informative and um, I just have a, a few things I can elaborate on. Uh, the first thing I, I sort of realized is that some of you may not know where to look for a job, um, where are jobs posted. So when, when I was back in grad school, I thought, oh, I'm going to look in Science Magazine. But in reality, PYs actually don't often have funding to advertise in such an expensive location. So you can find jobs advertised at the Chronicles of Higher Education on their online version or higheredjobs.com. I can type this into the chat later so you guys can find this. Um, and also look for jobs through, you know, going to conferences, word of mouth. You may even, if you're looking in a particular uh, city, go to every university website and see if they're advertising jobs because sometimes the jobs get advertised only on the university website because they don't actually have funding to post jobs elsewhere. Um, the rest of the the time I wanted to just talk about was how to make a really compelling teaching statement and get some of that teaching experience that we're expecting. Um, the key thing about the teaching a statement is it has to be believable. It has to show that you have some experience and interest. I've read a lot of teaching philosophies and statements where they sound like really pretty language and they talk about these esoteric thoughts about 
oh, I need to be learner centered, I need to do this, but they don't actually give me any concrete examples of how you taught in that way. And so, and teaching experience can be um, come upon in all sorts of different ways. Definitely by far and away the best is to actually teach a full blown course. So this can be through adjuncting, like Jeff mentioned. Um, adjuncting jobs are poorly advertised, but are around everywhere. <laughs> So uh, the best way to do it is, um, honestly, word of mouth is one of the best ways. Sometimes we don't post the job ad except for on our university website. And then what I do as say chair of my department is I email a bunch of people I know that might know potential grad students or postdocs who might want to teach a course. Um, these adjuncting positions often are laboratory courses, and they're often in the evenings. <laughs> and that's because people like me, I have a family. I want to go home by five and see my kids and husband. And so and in a way, these adjunct positions are quite perfect for someone like you because you can do your research in your postdoc or grad school lab, leave at four, okay, it's a little early, and then go, to, go teach gen chem lab somewhere. Um, the another option that's really good if you can do it is become a visiting assistant professor somewhere and like he said people go on sabbatical people go on maternity leave these are very teaching intensive positions they often are for one semester or two semesters and you might be teaching three four classes and they could be four different courses um but they will by far and away be the best prep for you at my university, we generally, we haven't hired someone in the last, I've been on about five or six different professor job searches. I don't think we've hired someone in the last three or four searches at least that hadn't taught a full blown course. This might vary depending on where you're looking, but if it's at all competitive, we're gonna be able to find somebody who has taught a full blown course or two. Um, that said, we will look at other people who have other types of um, teaching experience, um, such as TAing, TA in grad school, TA maybe when you're a postdoc. You can talk to your PI about becoming a guest lecturer in any courses they teach. Um, and finally, you can uh, go to the Center for Teaching Excellence that's on your campus. Probably almost every university <laughs> in the US has one by now. Go talk to them. See what teaching opportunities they might know about that they could offer you. See if you can enroll in a course that might teach you more about teaching. <laughs> See if you can go to webinars, um, seminars, um, online courses that teach you how to teach. Um, there's just so many more opportunities now. Join a journal club that reads papers about educational articles. Um, Finally, um, Andrea brought this up. It's really important that you have experience um, mentoring undergraduate research. Undergrads need a lot of help. They need a lot of hands-on help early on. You, if you handed them a protocol that you would normally hand a grad student or postdoc, they would just stare at it and have no idea what to do with it. They often come in and don't know very basic information, even if they've even taken the labs or the courses, it just sort of kind of blew past them. So you have to be very patient and be willing to spend a lot of time early on with them. Um, it's very rewarding if you love it, like I do. Um, and what can be nice is if you do sort of set up a group of five students, you can have one senior, one junior, one sophomore, and I try to make the senior train the junior and the junior train the sophomore. And then it becomes kind of a, a helpful little cycle where students learn not only to become a team player, but to be a mentor as well. I sort of don't want to go any further because I've talked way too long, um, but if you have any questions about the two-body problem, so if you have a spouse that is or significant other that also needs a job, I can talk about how I solve that problem myself. And if you have questions about how to balance life at a PI and being a mother or a parent, I can also answer about that. Thanks. Thanks so much, Melanie, for this discussion. It's getting me like all of this discussion is getting me super amped up for the Q&A session and uh, probably even more so than my morning joke. So, um, so I'm looking forward to it. So at this point, we're actually moving on to the, the Q&A session. So we have a number of questions actually already uh, submitted in uh, the Q&A function of Zoom. 
Um, what I want to address for the audience is if you really want a question addressed, um, give it a thumbs up um, rather than just type it again. Uh, that way we can best address it. Um, before addressing these questions in the Q&A session, we want to address a couple of questions that we received um, prior to the um, webinar. Um, so the first question uh, we got, which came from several folks, is um, a re re relatively general question uh, with regards to what does research at a, at a primarily undergraduate institute look like? Um, I know that we addressed this in a part of the webinar, um, but I'd like uh, the panel to discuss this in light of the application. So in terms of like, you know, what you should highlight in your application, um, you know, and, you know, how you can highlight, you know, what sort of research, you know, uh, you know, you can, you know, feasibly do at a PUI. I'll, I'm on, I, I'm unmuted, I'll talk. Um, yeah. So it depends on the PUI, right? Some institutions have students, um, have master's students. They're gonna have higher research requirements and more active groups. At my institution, um, I usually only work with two or three students at a time because of space um, and the equipment that I have. Um, so looking at what's happening at that university is important to make sure it's kind of pitched the right way. You want to think about projects that you can do with 10 weeks with students in summer that you may have for two years. Um, and really thinking about, can I take sophomore students or juniors, right? If you just take seniors, you get one, <laughs> one year out of them. Um, and what can I do once a week or with a student for three hours, right? Like what's kind of my minimum chunk of, of work? Undergrads can't give you eight hours in one day typically because they're working and they have classes and labs. So. Um, thinking practically about how students fit in is important. Great. Thanks so much, Andrea. Jeff, I think you also wanted to add a couple of points here. Yeah, I think just to, to build on that a little bit. Um, so I come, my graduate school and postdoc, um, we made a lot of solar cells. Um, working in Halide Propskites, we made, we made solar cells a lot. And one of the things that I had to change coming to a PUI, um, and it was a conscious choice, is we're not going to make solar cells anymore. Um, and that was really because, um, for those of you who have made those, uh, as you know, right, it takes, when I was training people to, to make devices, um, it would typically take me four to five weeks to train somebody to make good devices. Um, I don't have four to five weeks to train somebody to make anything. Um, so they have to be able to make good reproducible samples that we can use for things when I train them for a week or maybe two weeks. Um, so I think you have to, to think about your projects and, and what you're thinking about in that kind of way too. You know, what um, what techniques do we use that I, I can train on? Like we do, um, uh, as Andrea does, um, some like air-free syntheses and, and stuff. And we can you can do a lot, but I think you have to, to pare down and say what, you know, what things should we probably intentionally stay away from? Um, just because the, you know, the amount of training to get a, a brand new student up on the project would be too much. I just want to add is you also have to think about the cost of certain reagents. So um, depending on the research, you, certain avenues of research may be just so expensive, the reagents uh, that you will have to stay clear of, or they require such sophisticated equipment that is easily broken. You want to stay away from that. And always think about bite-sized chunks. I always think if I have an undergrad who could basically make one figure of a paper within the span of a year or two, that's a win. So every under undergraduate project, I kind of think of what's the figure they're gonna produce for this paper. Great, thank you so much for answering that question. Um, and the second question is uh, also, it was addressed uh, earlier, but I think it's also great to emphasize as well. So, um, you know, what does the teaching at a PUI uh, look like and how can folks, you know, best emphasize uh, you know, the teaching in their application, as well as potentially, you know, whenever they get invited to go to, to the interview, because teaching is super important, you know, at a, at a PUI, and uh, the quality of the teaching is, is great. And I know that some of our uh, panelists have brought up, you know, some mechanisms to get um, some experience. But, you know, what do you want to see, you know, in the application, as well as in the interview, in order to, um, you know, best highlight, you know, a teaching, relative teaching experience that's, you know, uh, advantageous for the application to a PUI. So we can start with uh, Andrea again. Sure. Um, 
So I didn't have a uh, formal teaching experience. So I highlighted things that I believed, right? I had definite um, theories about how I would teach my course, how I would des design it, um, how I would do active learning. So right, just alluding to active learning is not enough. <laughs> what is it that you're going to do? Because when you get hired, you then get to go write a syllabus, right? I'd never done that before. So, so being able to indicate that you have ideas. Um, it can be good to say that you would look at what the last person who taught the class would do and then build instead of doing something totally new because you don't know the context of that university. That just shows some wisdom. Um, it's important not to say your TA experience is teaching. So I said this is the closest thing I have, but I acknowledge that's not the same as being an instructor for a course. Um, so those are things to think about. Um, as far as load, I think Jeff's is different than mine. I have what's called a six course load. So I usually teach three courses each semester, and what that looks like is very different. Um, just so people have an idea of what kinds of things you might be diving into in your first year. Um, like this fall, I'll just teach um, thermo lecture and two lab sections. I teach the lab sections. I grade all the lab reports. That's my job. Um, I have TAs, but they don't, they can't grade because they don't know enough. Um, they're all undergraduates. Last spring, I had quantum lecture, I had the lab for that, and then I was team teaching instrumental analysis with a lab. So that only counted as three, but I might really have kind of four groups of students. And so just being aware it's that type of teaching that you're trying to squeeze your research into. Um, just for a <laughs> heads up. Yeah, thank you so much. Does anybody else have anything to add? I think um, highlighting your teaching experience in the interview is really critical. When you, um, Jeff mentioned this, but I do want to reiterate, when you're giving your job talk, when you're giving your research talk, think of it as you're teaching a lecture. Um, really think about putting up an outline and providing the significance early on so people are interested and excited about it. Making sure you avoid too much jargon so that people don't get lost. People hate things if they don't understand them. And then they think they blame it on you and not on them. So you really want to make it accessible and interesting. And, you know, it's probably going to be on Zoom if, if it's um, this year. So get really acquainted with being on Zoom and give practice talks on Zoom. See if you can do, master some of the cool features of Zoom, like breakout rooms. Think about even using that in your job interview where you give some sort of small lecture, then you stop, ask a question for the, your audience members to discuss it, then come back, or use the polling feature in Zoom. This sort of shows this sort of savviness about online teaching and online presentations that can really make you stand out, because then they're going to be like, oh, this person's prepared. This person's thought about how to make a lecture interactive. Great. Thank you so much for that. Those are some excellent tips. Jeff, do you have anything you want to add with regards to, um, you know, what we can highlight in terms of teaching and the application or interview? Yeah. Um, I mean, I maybe a little bit that, that I can add. I think one of the things that um, just as far as comfort level and the interview going across well, I think you really have to think about concrete examples for teaching. So that when you're asked a question about how do you teach, you have a real example that um, even if it's if it's from TA experience, if it's from mentoring undergraduates in lab, um, if you don't have formal teaching experience, but to have real concrete examples about, um, right, kind of as, as Andrea said, you, you don't want to just say active learning. You want to actually talk about an actual example, either what you're going to do or hopefully something that you've already done. Um, so I think that's for um, the teaching statement for the interview process. I think as much as you can try to, to ground it in things that you've actually done or examples that um, you can really start to make concrete. Great, thank you so much for all these tips. Um, so I'm gonna jump over to some of the online submitted questions and I see one that's really popular. So the this first question from the online submitted, um, Q&A is, uh, what is different in the fundraising process for your research at a PUI? And um, maybe in how that, that fundraising process is a little bit different compared to like maybe an R1 institution, research intensive institution. So um, does anyone wanna uh, take the lead on this question? Uh, Melanie? Um, so yes, fundraising is very important. It, it's also nice in that it allows you to have a summer salary so 
Although our summer starting salary might be low, you can boost it by two months salary if you can get an out external grant. Um, and it allows you to do research that you wouldn't normally be able to do. There's tons of different re um, opportunities depending on the university. They could be internal or definitely external. So when I started at my university, they had pretty much no mechanisms to support research. We had nothing. But I was the first person to ask for a startup package. I wanted them to purchase a bunch of different instruments so that I could do my research and they agreed. Um, so don't be afraid to ask. That's another thing. Um, we kept asking and asking and we eventually got um, research assistant um, funding. So 5,000 a year to fund one or two undergrads in your lab. We also asked and asked and asked and we finally got summer stipends for those people who don't have research grants that are funding them externally. So start inside and then go outside. Um, the inside grants tend to be less competitive and easier, especially for younger professors. They really want to support you. Um, once you kind of have your feet on the ground and you have some preliminary data, start thinking about writing um, a grant to get external funding. So in my field, I can apply for either grants at NIH or NSF. And there are certain types of grants that are earmarked for PUIs. So the type of grant I have right now is called an NSF um, RUI, and it's for research at undergraduate institutions. And uh, people at MIT can't apply for this, okay? <laughs> so it's really nice. I'm, I'm not being compared to those people. Uh, there's also something called an NSF Career Award that is for early um, educator um, professors doing research. And then there's also NIH area grants, or R15s. And I can type this up in the chat. Um, those are for my field. There's also all sorts of travel fellowships and other types of things that are really uniquely for educators. And it just takes some Googling to find them. And uh, my best advice, I've been pretty successful at getting external grants, is don't apply for them every year. Don't keep applying. Don't do it super, don't rush them. Instead, you know, work at your university to provide a really good body of preliminary data to show that you can do research at your institution. And this makes a much stronger, thought, well thought out proposal and you're more likely to get it. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I have one follow-up question for Melanie uh, too. So in terms of, you listed all these uh, great funding uh, agencies that folks can you know uh you know apply to do you think in their application it's beneficial to list you know where they could um you know apply to to attract external funding you know directly in the application do you think that's beneficial yes but you have to be savvy about it and make sure that you are eligible so not all puis are actually eligible for an rui so if you, for example if you have a an, a pui um, that has a really strong economics program, for example, and they pump out a ton of PhDs, but maybe you have no PhDs in the STEMs getting produced, you still may not be eligible for this type of funding. So um, it can be helpful, but just make sure that whatever you say you think you can apply for, that they would probably be eligible for it. Hey, thank you so it's much. You know what, that you're thinking about grant writing. I think that shows you're ambitious, and I think that is useful to kind of know what you're eligible for. Great, Andrea or Jeff, do you have anything to add with uh, with regards to fundraising? I think Andrea is right. I have a yeah, I have a small one. I put another thing in the chat, but um, one thing to be aware of is sometimes you have less support for applying for grants. As Melanie mentioned, your university may want a research program and not yet have all the mechanics in place. So when I started, we did not have an office of sponsored research. Some of you may not know what that is, but it's and administrative people to help you manage grants and apply for them to help make sure your NSF proposal is put together. That used to be what our Dean of Natural Sciences um, assistant did on top of her other duties. And so you need to start early and may need to be relatively independent as you're applying for some of this funding. Um, these are things to ask about, right? What kind of support they have for managing your grants um, as you're getting going, depending on how research active you want to be, right? Hey, thank you. And Jeff? Yeah, I can, I can jump in a little bit. So at Hope, um, this may be a little bit different. We had 
uh, we have a fairly robust research program here. So we have an office for sponsored research and that's been around for quite a while. It's been really helpful for me, um, you know, submitting grants and, you know, having somebody to help work out the budget and make sure all the details are, are you know, accounted for and that there are letters of support from all the right people. Um, but I've also uh, found, right, you don't need as much funding to be successful, to have a, have a group run at an undergraduate institution. So for example, the funding that I have right now, uh, I, have, I have some startup money, which I got when I started here at Hope um, for buying equipment and chemicals and supplies. Um, Hope has an internal uh, grant that you can write. I think it's, you know, something like $7,500. Um, so it's enough for a student and then some for your salary and some for chemicals and supplies. Um, our divisional dean gives kind of each department a free student that they can share, with, you know, with whoever, whoever needs it. Our department has some money for, you know, a free student or to, you know, if you get $3,000 for a student, you know, our department has money to cover the rest. Um, some of those kind of things are one of the other grants I have right now is from the Michigan Space Grant Consortium, which is um, run out of the University of Michigan. And they run, uh, they have, I have one student supported under like a, there's a $3,000 fellowship from them. And then um, the department kind of picks up the rest of his salary. And then I have a $10,000 grant, um, you know, which can pay for conference travel and supplies and stuff like that through them. So um, I guess the, Sometimes there are some of these less competitive grants and, and with some of those you can piece together, you know, smaller bits of funding through those to, to be able to support students, whether it's an internal grant, external grants. Um, I know ACS has the, the Petroleum Research Fund, um, which a number of my colleagues have, have had and, and get startup money um, for new faculty through there of maybe fifty or $75,000 and that goes a long way at a place um, like Hope. Great. This is all excellent discussion. Uh, so I want to move on to the next question since it was it asked a few different times, um, and it's actually with regards to the two body problem that uh, Melanie brought up uh, in one of uh, in part of her discussion. So I wanted to uh, get some further discussion of the two body. I, I like to call it the two body situation. Uh, you know, for for scientists, and then also I, I like to combine it with a question of you know like. Do you think it would be useful, you know, for folks that are in the situation to have, like, you know, one become an assistant professor and one become an adjunct? Um, and, you know, like, how do you think folks can best juggle this sort of situation? And so, Melanie, do you want to, um, you know, discuss further first, then we can have comments from uh, Andrea and Jeff as well. Uh, sure. Um, the two-body problem is hard and it's very common. Um, we're scientists and we spend a lot of time in labs and we tend to meet our spouses there. Um, the way that my that I worked it out was my husband and I talked and we decided who was more flexible. Who, because if, if you cannot both be rigid and be like, I need this job in this place with this type of that. So we both spoke and I was open to all sorts of positions and I was open to all sorts of places and ultimately we decided that he would go on the job market first and whatever city we ended up being in, I would look for jobs there. Um, the key thing with two bodies is you both need to find a job. So obviously he couldn't be applying to say universities in the middle of nowhere that didn't have a biochemistry department, right? Uh, so we had to kind of make some compromises um, he ended up getting a really great job in Boston, and so, and we chose to primarily look at big cities because we knew big cities had lots of opportunities in my field. Um, and then after he got the job, I started looking for my job the very next year. That limited my job search quite a bit. Instead of applying to, say, 30 PUIs across the country, I only applied to 10. That was kind of scary to me. and. Um, but at the, on the one hand, that was really good because I made every single one of my packages very specific to that, those 10 places. I knew every, I had enough time to really research um, all these different colleges, find out what sort of instruments they had, what sort of things they were looking for. And so my packages were stronger overall. Um, it may take a couple years on the job search to get that second person the job. 
and that's something you might have to wait. On the other hand, I want to caution everyone, <laughs> please do not become an adjunct for life. So adjuncting is a temporary position. It is very badly paid. You get to teach courses, which is great, and it's flexible, but you often don't get any health care or benefits. You have no job security. Literally a week before classes start, they could cancel your class, and then you're left without a, a livelihood. Um, they don't care about you. I mean, the faculty that you know care about you, but the institution themselves will not. And so really think of adjuncting as a very temporary thing you will do. Don't do it for more than two years. If you've done it for two years and you're still looking, you probably need to think about an alternative career. And by the way, PUI jobs are alternative careers. It's only probably less than 10% of people who go and do what we're doing. Great, thank you so much, Melanie. Andrea or Jeff, do you have any additional comments on uh, the two body problem or situation or as well as adjuncting? No? I had the problem even though my spouse isn't in science or a teacher, but he is in the aerospace field and so there were like three places he could get jobs. Right, and so when I picked places, um, I did much like Melanie did and I kind of had my own timeline. So I think you just wanna be honest with yourself about what it is that you want, where you're flexible, um, and you have to solve this problem in your marriage with the two people, right, or however many, right, or in that relationship, you need to find a solution that works for, specifically to the two of you. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, so um, this next question, um, I'm gonna try to combine a few questions uh, with, with this one. Um, so. Uh, with regards to the application process, whenever your search committees, you know, gather up all the applications and start going through them, what is the, what are the sort of things that help you, um, you know, separate the applications into you know, potentially three piles? A, you know, the the folks that actually, you know, are definitely going to get the interview. B, possibly interview. Or C, you know, the folks that you know, aren't going to be considered. Um, and so, folks in the chat room have. Uh, written things, you know, like, you know, our papers actually, um, you know, uh, have greater weight, does teaching have greater weight, you know, what sort of things, you know, are, are you know, most important for your search committees. Um, so I wanted to see if uh, folks on our panel can uh, help answer this question. So I can, I can maybe start. Um, so I'll, I'll preface this and say that uh, both of my colleagues here have, have more experience on this than I do, but I can give um, some things that, that I've heard from kind of other people around our institution. Um, so when we are looking at people, we really are looking for people with postdocs. Um, and I know from my own experience, having a, a research postdoc, right, I worked at a national lab, we only did research. I didn't do any teaching during my postdoc. Um, that really helped start up my research group. Um, I was really valuable experience for me, especially now, um, you know, I'm, I'm really the only one working in my area here at Hope. So having extra collaborators and that extra experience was really helpful. So we, we typically um, are not looking at people that are coming right out of graduate school. Um, and I think another thing that, that we're really looking for is um, people who specifically want to work at a PUI. Like that's, that's the very the first criteria that that gets people you know swept off the into the no pile is uh, people who clearly are you know applying because they saw a job posting but aren't really um, you know it, it's kind of clear from their application that they're really looking for an R one job or you know a more research focused job and, and aren't really specifically looking at a PUI. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Andrea. Do you have anything to add here? No, I was typing in the Q and A. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> good answer, Jeff. I, I've been on a, a lot of job searches, and it is really hard. You will get anywhere from thirty to more than a hundred applicants. Um, we start weeding out people who don't have complete packages. It's a really easy thing to do if you don't have any letters of rec. We just don't even look at your stuff because we're like, well, if you can't even, or if you haven't sent in all of the items, if you haven't sent in a teaching statement, you only sent out some things. So be really careful to make sure all your all of your materials have actually been submitted. Email the person in charge of the the job search and say, do all, are all my letters of rec there? And um, then we 
what we typically do is we try to narrow it down to like the top 10 and we have a discussion about the top 10. And those top 10, I often make an Excel file because it's so hard to keep the information for 30 different people in, in my head. Um, and I'll make notes about how much teaching experience they have. Does their research statement make sense? Does it seem feasible? There's also this sort of magical quality that I'm going to talk about, which is called fit. You know, like some people just don't fit, right? We're not looking for what you're offering and you might be like the most amazing candidate. But if we're really looking for, say, a botanist and your work is only slightly tangentially related to botany, you're probably not going to make the cut. So we, we're looking at rec letters, we're looking at um, research statements, teaching experience, teaching statements, the CV. I do want to see that you've published. Um, I, I think a lot of people think, oh, I can't get published, so I'll just go become a professor to PY. And that's not the case because I'm expected to publish. And if you couldn't publish when you were spending 100% of your time, doing research it says you're not you're going to have a really hard time completing a project when only 30 percent or 40 percent of your time is spent doing research um so we're, i'm also looking for um, postdoc experience i think i would be a much worse pi and professor and mentor if i didn't have that postdoc experience and frankly the thing, thing is is there's so many candidates we can easily eliminate people just by that too Great, thank you so much for all this insight. This is super useful. Um, I have a question now. It's more gauged towards the interview side. You know, folks, you know, submit an application, uh, you know, and get invited for the interview. Uh, some folks asked if, like, it's required, you know, to give a teaching demonstration. I know that Jeff in his presentation said, you know, like um, sometimes, you know, your your talk, um, you know, is actually, you know, being used as like a, kind of like a teaching demonstration. Andrea and Melanie also elucidated a little bit. On that. But, um, you know, can you give a little bit more on, you know, uh, more information about a teaching demonstration, maybe what's expected, um, you know, and like whenever you apply, did you have to do this and how did you maybe best prepare? Yes, Melanie. I can do one. It was pretty horrible because I was told, okay, you're going to teach purine metabolism to my biochem class on this date. And so then I was just left with a million questions like, Where's the syllabus? What textbook are you using? What's the format that you usually use? I don't want to come in and just completely, you know, craze out the students because I'm so different in my teaching style. So I had to do a lot of asking, how many students are there? Are they used to participating? Are they used to ask, answering questions? Because you don't want to show up and be super interactive. And then they're all just frozen because they're like, I've never been asked a single question. Oh my God, what is this woman doing? So you have to ask a lot of questions if you are going to do a teaching demo. Um, that was my experience. Since then, we, we always have a teaching demo. Um, it has varied somewhat um, in the past. We've had some professors just come in and we say, okay, choose one of these subjects because this is our Gen Chem curriculum sequence. You can teach on this day, this day, or this day, and they have to teach whatever it is the subject is for that. We've also had some job searches where they're like, you can choose whatever topic you want to talk about and teach. And then in other cases, and I think this was our best um, scenario, was we had all professors come in and do the same subject. And that really allowed us to compare apples to apples. And how did this person go into depth on this subject? And how did they make this lecture or discussion interactive? Did they have hands-on demos? You know, how did they get the students involved and interested in the project? Um, be prepared, they could ask you to do this. And it's a ton of work to prepare a lecture for a course you've never taught. Great, thanks, Melanie. Jeff or Andrea, I think Andrea's ready to go. Yeah, I, uh, so in one of my interviews, I did a teaching, I, I went into a class, so I think I was given like 20 or 30 minutes in a general chemistry course to just go teach on a subject. Um, it's, I want to reiterate Melanie's um, point that you should ask a lot of questions about the class because um, you don't know where these students are or the expectations. Um, so you should definitely do what's authentic to you because you're going to get judged by faculty that you don't know very well. Um, in my current position, I did not do a teaching um, experience and sometimes we don't uh, just because it can be hard to schedule it in in the, in this, in the interview schedule. 
but then your research talk does serve as both. So sometimes we will ask people to teach something during their research talk. Um, and that gets really challenging because you're trying to show that, you, that you're an excellent researcher, but also a teacher. Um, and know that we often have students in the audience who are going to tell us what they thought about the talk as well. So you're being judged by faculty. You're being judged on how you connect with the students. Um, we also have like going to lunch with students. So you need to take your student interactions very seriously because we do um, at PUIs. Um, yeah, I can, if you're done, Andrea, um, I can, okay. <laughs> um, I can give uh, kind of two different things. So at Hope, we typically, we don't um, do mock classes. I have done them at, in an interview and my experience was I was given a list of three topics and told I could pick any one of the three topics. Um, and then I went in and the actual class was taught to students, but they were students from a different, like it was uh, an engineering controls class and I was teaching a fluid mechanics lecture. Uh, so then we were really like jumping into the middle of fluid mechanics and, and it, was a, it was an interesting experience. Um, Definitely, it's something I reiterate what, what both of um, Andrea and Melanie talked about is it's something where you, you really have to ask questions um, because it's something where every school is going to do it differently. Even if they're you know telling you to teach a mock class, it's going to be different at every place. You really want to be asking questions. You want to know what's expected of you. Um, and I think that's all of the parts that, that you're kind of active in in the interview, right? Whether it's your research talk, whether it's teaching a mock class. Um, ask questions so that you know what's expected because that's where things can really um, fly off the rails is when you show up and you don't know what the expectations are and, and your expectations don't match what theirs are. Like, do not assume that you'll have power, PowerPoint. They may just put you into a room that has a chalkboard. So ask, do you have a whiteboard? Do you have a chalkboard? Do you have a projector? Ask all these things. How many students? Great. These are excellent points and uh, super helpful for folks to prepare for the, uh, the interview process. Um, so I know we're getting towards the end of our Q&A session as well as the webinar, but I do want to address uh, just two more questions. So the, the um, first question is actually it comes from our, our uh, chat room and folks have asked, you know, where can they find, you know, maybe a list of, of places, you know, where we can have, um, you know, like uh, of places to apply for a PUI. Um, and also I wanted to give our panelists an opportunity to um, maybe highlight any specific opportunities that they know. So I, I can start. Um, so one of the, the best spots actually for, for my discipline, which is chemical engineering and chemistry, um, is ChemJobber. So if you've never heard of him, he posts every, um, he's a, a chemist that works in industry but just as a side hustle and kind of a service to the community, he posts, um, compiles and, and makes a blog of every open chemistry or chemical engineering position in the country, um, both PUI and R1. So if you haven't heard of him, um, you can find him on Twitter um, or find his blog. And he has a, an Excel spreadsheet that he keeps track of, you know, schools and what they're looking for. And, and it's, it's really a great resource. Um, this fall, oh sorry, this fall we are looking to hire a tenure line chemist, um, ideally someone who could teach analytical chemistry. Um, they don't have to be an analytical chemist, but being able to speak to that would be really useful. Um, so I think there is a link in the chat somewhere. Am I correct, Zach? Oh, there it is again. From yeah, right. so, yeah. um, you it. There, um, if you're interested in the type of PUI that I am at. Great. And then Melanie, do you have uh, any other tips for this? Um, I think somewhere earlier in the chat, I put up uh, Chronicles of Higher Education and higheredjobs.com. And probably also CNE News, now that I think about it. They probably do a lot of advertising of jobs, too. Great. So I just have one more question for everyone. So I wanted you to have a chance to Tell everybody, you know, what your favorite part of, you know, being a professor at a PUI is. I know that you described, you know, why, you know, you chose this, this job career, but I want you to give it a chance of like, you know, what do you find you know, most gratifying, you know, in your day-to-day -day job? Um, so we could probably start with uh, Jeff, then we can move to Melanie and then Andrea. 
Um, yeah, so I'll try to keep it short. I would say two things. One, I, I really love research with undergrads. I think it's super fun. It, it forces me to be creative um, in what I'm doing, and it forces me to be in the lab really working and mentoring students. And, you know, you see people from, you know, over the course of 10 weeks go from knowing absolutely nothing to being, you know, somewhat competent in the lab, and it's, it's really fun. Um, and I like uh, kind of the breadth of my teaching interactions. Um, so I, I like a lot of different things. So being able to teach kind of more broadly has is, is been something that's fun. It keeps me learning new things and, and trying to figure out new ways to teach things and, and keeps the teaching aspect of it interesting. Um, I think my favorite thing is being able to mesh my love of teaching and research together. So I love designing lab courses for undergraduates that I teach to embed the research within the lab course. And it's like a structured research experience. I feel like it takes a lot of creativity because you can't just pick up, you know, um, a textbook and teach them how to do research. You really have to think about what, what do you have on hand? What, what materials do you have it, that you know that you can teach them how to solve a problem and really transform the student from a student to thinking about themselves as a scientist. And that's just really, really fun. And I'm gonna add a bonus answer to a question not asked, which is my least favorite thing is grading lab reports. Mine is a lot like uh, what Jeff and Melanie said. Um, I've. I love that being at a small school, so I'm at a liberal arts institution, I actually know colleagues from all over the university. Um, and so I've been able to collaborate um, and teach courses that I would never get to in an R1. So I have developed a food chemistry course for non-majors um, to help them get their science requirement without taking gen chem right, that meets more their, their needs. Um, and that's been great, and that was really fun for me to do. Um, but also I got to teach a writing 101 course for new freshmen um, for our STEM house, right? So it was all people who wanted to do science, but we got to work on writing. And those are the kinds of things I get to do because I am at a PUI. Great, thank you guys so much for everything. I know we're you know at the end of end of the webinar, so I want to give uh, you know I want to thank everyone for um, for their time. Uh, specifically, I want to thank uh, Jeffrey Christians. Uh, for being our main speaker, Melanie Berkman for being a panelist, and Andrea Monroe for being a panelist as well. Um, and I also want to thank the, uh, you know, thank everyone who attended today's webinar. Um, we also want to thank our fellow um, members of the earlier Early Career Professionals Subcommittee of the MRS. Um, we are a subcommittee of the MRS that organizes events to help you know, early career professionals in their career development. I want to also highlight that we have some upcoming events within our sub, uh, they're organized by our subcommittee. We have a broader impacts event fall 2020, which focuses on early career development, where we will highlight insights from academia as well as industry. Also, we organize uh, poster sessions uh, for you know, meet your faculty candidate, um, as well as meet your industry and national lab candidate as well at MRS meetings. Um, also, we have a number of questions, you know, within this webinar, uh, the chat room that I know we haven't addressed, but we hope to be able to address these in future MRS programs, um, uh, the, both those that are uh, organized by our subcommittee as well as some of the other committees of MRS. Um, as a reminder, this webinar is recorded, so you can access this in the coming days on the MRS website. Um, I want to thank our uh, panelists and our speaker uh, once again for the excellent uh, insights that you brought to this uh, webinar series. Um, and at this point, I want to turn the webinar back over to my fellow Pittsburgher, Bob, um, who will close out the webinar. <laughs>